right. Welcome back, everybody, to this afternoon session of the Me Convention. Please put on your headphones. Otherwise, uh, I can see at least one gentleman in the middle not wearing headphones. He might be wondering why he can't hear a thing literally not hearing what I just said. So everybody, please wear your headphones. It's channel number two for this room because this next talk is going to be exciting and it's going to be a packed 45 minutes. Our next speaker will be likely speaking for 45 minutes because she just has so much, so much of a message to bring us. So our next speaker is an author and a long-standing human rights activist. She hails from Nairobi, Kenya, but actually spent quite a long time in Germany. She was here for a number of years and then worked for the internet National NGO CARE. She volunteered for a number of civic causes as well and has basically worked tirelessly to empower young Africans to reach their full potential. So today she will speak um, as the founder of the Saudi Ku Foundation. Saudi Ku is Swahili, it actually means strong voices, and she is here to basically explain the work of Saudi Ku and how to empower young Africans. Um, she also happens to be related to a certain former US president, but I can assure you she speaks German much better than he does. Please welcome the founder of the Saudi Ku Foundation, Dr. Alma Obama. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for being here and listening to me. I know there are a lot of exciting things you could be doing out there and some beautiful cars you could be looking at, but I promise I won't bore you and hopefully not take too long so that you can go and enjoy the cars as well. So. I'm here to talk to you about my foundation and the work that I do there. And basically the reason I talk about what I do is because I want to make you think a little bit. Uh, in German they say Impulsrede. I want to challenge you on your perception of me, I stand here as an African woman, on your perception of Africa as a continent, because that's where I come from, and on your perception on how we interact with each other. And in most cases, the, the first thing that comes to mind is development aid. Please don't be distracted by the pictures you'll be seeing in the background. They move in a loop, but they tell the story that I'm going to tell you here. So as you look at them, don't be too intent on looking at them because they're going to go through all of my, my talk, so you'll see them several times over. You get to know the children I work with. You get to know the environment I work in. My talk is called, You Are Your Future, Poverty Is No Excuse. And I want, you to tell you, I want to tell you about our model, how we tackle the idea of you being your future and why poverty is no excuse. We work with children from the ages of four to 25 years old and we challenge the idea of dependency and passivity that we have on our continent, which if you deal with that continent, you're very aware of. Again, I'm talking in the context of the classical development aid. We have a community of people who consider themselves poor because we've defined them as being poor. I call it a community of beggars asking all the time to be helped. Gimme, gimme, gimme. It is a culture that we've created over the last, let's say, 70 years. And if you see this community of people, if you visit them, some of you may have heard of slum tourism, we have a culture whereby the people play a waiting game. What I mean by a waiting game is that they wait in hope that somebody will come, and usually that somebody is middle-aged, possibly white, has a bit of a beard, and is in the development. Nowadays, they don't wear Birkenstock. We come quite normally dressed because it's, that, that it's established itself as an institution. And that person will save their lives, their family's lives, and possibly their children's lives because they will be picked out of the many who are in the slums waiting to be found and be assisted. The reason I say this is because I often try to get people to leave the slums and they tell me nobody will go away because if you're in the rural area, your poverty is not seen. So in the slums, in the urban area, poverty is obvious, so that's where I possibly may get helped. But what is happening with this kind of a mentality is that on the other side, in the West, we now have a culture of fatigue. 
Our culture is of gimme, 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 because I'm poor, right? And then there's the culture of fatigue because it's a bottomless pit. We keep pouring money into this continent, but nothing changes. They're still poor. They're still starving, and they're still asking for help. And that is a big, big problem. Now, the reason for the culture of dependency, I say, and I want to please qualify all of what I say is me, and I am not politically correct, but I, I stand by not being politically correct, because change will not happen if you're politically correct. So the reason for this culture of, of dependency is because we view this continent already as poor. But not just as a poor continent, not even as a poor continent, as a poor country. We talk of Africa as, were, as if it were a country. Not 55 independent countries doing a lot of different diverse things and very diverse in culture, in their economics, etc., etc. So we view Africa as a country. Especially, I have lived in Germany, you were told I speak German. When you talk of Africa, very often people say, das Land, the country like a little country that you can take in your hands and you can help, like a bird that has fallen out of the nest and we will look after and we will repair and make whole again. It hasn't happened, people, and it's not going to happen so long as we take this approach. It's not going to have to happen. Africa is not a country, Africa is a continent. The other problem we have is our, as I said, classical development aid. And I keep saying the classical one because I think there's a move and an attempt towards doing something different. We'll see how far we've gotten. Maybe we can have that conversation later. So development aid. Development aid is an establishment that wants to help, help Africa in particular. And I say that because if you go on Wikipedia looking at what development aid is, almost all, and maybe they've updated it so I might be wrong here, almost all the examples are of the African continent. So development aid is associated directly with this continent. That is our legacy. That is my legacy as an African. So the mindset around this continent, regardless of what you do with it, is about helping it. It's helpless. It's struggling. It's on its knees. And we, on our side, are victims. We are dependent because we're victims of whatever it is we decide to define poverty as. And on top of that, we feel entitled to get this help. I said I'm not politically correct. But because most people are politically correct, they come to us and then they have this sense of, oh my God, you know, this is our fault. I feel so bad because we in the West, escape uns so good. We're doing so much better than them. So we owe them. We have to help them. That's what I experience a lot in the work that I do. People feel that they have to help us because they kind of feel bad because somehow in the West they're doing much better than we are down there on the continent. So I want to kind of change that perception. In fact, that is the core of all of what I do and talk about certain solutions to this problem because we're all at fault. We, the victims, and those who think they're going to help us out of our misery, even a 19-year-old person coming to do his internship with us feels that he can give me solutions to the problems of Africa because he's coming from the West. It's okay, that's what he was taught. That's what he's growing up with. So the first thing we have to do is we have to redefine poverty. Who says what poverty is? Just because I don't have running water and I don't have electricity doesn't mean I'm poor. Because I know that in the Nordic countries, if you go on holiday, you will pay a lot of money to stay in a cabin where you're going into a, in German they say plums toilet, I think they're called pit toilet, and there's no electricity, and you pay a lot of money to go back to nature. We get that gratis, we get that free. <laughs> so we can't be that poor. So we can't, we can't be that poor. And if you look at some of the pictures of where we are, you will notice that we have huts there, which are the coolest places on the whole of that side because the temperature sometimes is 20, 32 degrees in the area that we work in, or even 35 when it's a really hot day. So it's the coolest area and it's actually really beautiful. So we need to redefine what poverty is. We need to redefine what development aid is. And I'll explain in a little while why and what we should be calling it. We need to change our mindset from being victims to active players in what happens with our lives and the interactions we have with people who come into our lives who want to, and also with really honestly and with goodwill want to work with us to improve our situation or improve our part of the world because there's nothing wrong with wanting to do it. It's the how that matters. And the how is the big problem here. So again, for me, I ask the question, how? And you'll notice one of the slides has just got common sense, common sense, common sense, common sense, common sense, and the power of no. 
and I'll add to that the power of why, okay? Because in all of the interactions that we have with each other, even if I am poor, and you know my talk says poverty is no excuse, even if I am poor, if I have my arms, my legs, my senses, why do I stay poor? That is the question asked with a why. Why do I stay poor? Where my grandmother, who is 95 years old, when I ask her the question, she says, all these people are just lazy because they have their arms, their legs, their senses. Why are they not working? And that is the question I ask. I grew up asking why. I came back into my community after many years in Europe asking why. Why are we still considered poor when we have land? Look at that land. It's beautiful. We're growing all those crops. Why are we poor? Why are we begging? Why have we stopped subsidizing the urban areas with what we grow on our land and the urban area like myself and urbans, urbanites have to come to visit and before I arrive I'm stopping everywhere possible to try and buy vegetables because I know by the time I get to my, my rural area there's no food to be bought because at the market somebody's selling three tomatoes, two avocados and five species of uh, leaves of vegetable because nobody's growing anything on this land. Why? And it doesn't make sense. So the core of the work that we do is based on common sense. What makes sense in this community? What makes sense? And with this question, we challenge the concept of development aid. This challenge is not new. I'll quote uh, an economist, Peter Bauer, who said, and I'll read, an excellent method, this is now what he considers development aid, is an excellent method for transferring money from poor people in rich countries to rich people in poor countries. Indeed, this is what is actually happening in many cases. I don't want to say too much, but very often the bigger named organizations, development organizations, will only work with our governments. I rest my case about transferring money from poor people in rich countries to rich people in poor countries. Because most of the people who donate are your normal Joe blogs, your everyday man on the street who gives you your 20 euros, your 20 dollars, in order to help the poor people in our part of the world. So we need to challenge that concept. We need to challenge it. And we need to challenge it not just because I say, oh, don't take any money there, don't donate, because we as South Korea, we need funds, because we are a nonprofit. Either way, even as I talk, I know that I need donors and I need people to fund my work. But it has to be done intelligently. It has to make sense. And the reason I say that is because even if you're putting money into an organization, into this continent. It can't be sustainable if you're doing it on the premises of your helping. It can't be sustainable if you're doing it on the premises that it's charity or philanthropy. Because charity and philanthropy has its place. Look at Houston, Texas, the floods. That's where you need development aid. But that's because it's, that's what it's called. I would just say that's where you need philanthropy. Because at that moment, people have lost their homes, have lost their lives, and they need immediate assistance now. Put your money in there, donate, assist. That is where that kind, that is what aid is about. That's what traditionally aid should be. Because it's immediate, it's now. You want to either boost, you want to either stop a conflict, i.e. Syria, or you want to stop a catastrophe, a natural catastrophe in most cases, i.e. Houston. That's where you do your development aid or your aid, period. If you're talking about working with communities and moving them forward, you cannot talk about it as if it's a charity or philanthropic act. It is not going to be sustainable at all. And it's proven because we've been having development aid for the last, what, 70 years, almost 100 years? And guess what? Before that time, even during the colonial period, because we are not part of the equation of the economy, we were able to sustain ourselves. We were able to feed ourselves for thousands of years. People forget that. Nobody's asking the question, how come this continent could feed itself, could keep the land um, uh, uh, healthy, as in we didn't use chemical you know, fertilizer, we didn't burn the, the earth. How could we do that all those years? And suddenly, once we interacted with the West, we suddenly couldn't do it anymore. And suddenly we're so helpless. This is, that's why I have to refer to my grandmother all the time because she's not only my role model, but she's 95. So she's older than the 70 years I'm talking about. And when I ask her, she tells me, Auma, we have forgotten how we looked after ourselves. We have forgotten how we fed ourselves. We have forgotten how we nurtured the land to sustain ourselves. She uses that word. 
with the 95 years that she has. So part of the work that we're trying to do at Sautiku is to remind ourselves, to remind our communities of what we had and what we were capable of before we decided it's not good enough. And it really is true, we decided it's not good enough because it's not modern. But guess who wants organic food, organic produce? You know, and guess how expensive it is in the West? Because everybody is realizing that actually that is the way to go. We need to go back to what we had before. We need to go back, and it's not just an environmental issue, it's a sustainability issue. Because we managed for thousands of years to sustain ourselves. That is what Sautiku is trying to do. That's where Sautiku is trying to go with its work. Sautiku means, I know um, the moderator who introduced me called it uh, strong voices. Actually, it's powerful voices. That's the meaning. Kiswahili strong is also cool, but powerful voices is what we mean. Because the young people are going to have a voice to be able to use the power of no and the power of why to ask why are we poor? Why are we considered poor? And if it's not, doesn't make sense, then we have to say no and we assess the situation. So instead of talking about development aid, even if we call it uh, uh, development cooperation, what I'd like to say is we need to call it economic growth, sustainable economic growth. The interaction with each other has to be around economy because that's what it is at the end of the day. To remove dependencies, to get those people out of the slums, they have to have money. They have to be financially able to look after themselves, which means they have to have jobs, which means they have to get into the economic value chain in order for them not to be dependent. So the conversation isn't about helping, because it doesn't, helping is actually just, a, it's, a, it's very vague. What are you gonna do? Because some of the help is you do some sports with the kids, but you can throw a ball in the mix and then what? And if you're there only for three years because the money only lasts three years, then what happens to the 10-year-old you started with who is now 13? They're still going to stay poor. So it's got to be sustainable. It's got to be long-term. And it's got to be about getting people to a place where they're financially independent and no longer dependent. We do not want to keep ourselves in a space of benevolence because it creates dependencies. We do not want to have passive recipients because we get a bottomless pit because that's what everybody talks about, the bottomless pit that is Africa. It's not true. We have created that bottomless pit because, let me be really provocative and say, we're just either afraid, too comfortable, or we know what we're getting through the back door on the, from this continent. So if we could be more honest about the approach that we have, we would get much further. And the reason why we have to do that and we have to redefi redefine aid is because all these young people are growing up and guess what? Because of the internet and the connectivity, they know what is going on globally. They know the positioning of the different countries. They know what is possible. And with all that possibility, I'll tell you that in, on the continent, between the ages of uh, 15 to 30, it's about 75% of the population. And now when you look at the employment rate of that group who are called youth, over 50% are unemployed. So you've got over 50% of young people who are restless, frustrated, and don't know what to do, and see no prospects at all. So we have to address it. And we have to address it on a global level because we interact with each other globally. We are interconnected, whether we like it or not. And it's not about being nice to each other. It's not about, the, oh, you know, we don't want to be so, so, so you know, we, we want to be nice. It, it's not, it doesn't matter what your political direction is. We have to interact with each other. We have to start thinking of this issue around what's going on in this continent as a global issue and a global challenge. I don't call it a problem because I don't think these children are a problem. Are problem. They're a potential. And we need to tap into that potential. And on top of that, we need to know that if we're giving handouts, we don't enable. If we're giving handouts, we don't create opportunities. Because those opportunities are only sustainable if we have a long-term plan about their financial independence. So we need to move away from the idea of development aid to an idea of saying we want to move them to the mainstream economic growth and development space. Again, the economic value chain become part of that. That's why I talk about trade, not aid. Because when you're talking trade, then you're really talking to the young people and say, where do you fit into the world economic uh, structure? And they have to fit in. Because those who are jobless and don't have a job become a problem in the end. And we all know what that leads to. 
I don't have to spell it out. And the other problem we have on these lines, and I, I will talk about nice things eventually. I know I'm saying problem after problem after problem. I'll come to the nice things. Is that when we talk about having any relationship with Africa, the continent, we talk about aid. When we're talking about Europe, Asia, or the US, we talk about bilateral trade agreements. So it's very confusing for us because we get helped when we get some money donated to do some project. But on the other hand, there are a lot of companies that are doing business on the continent, but we don't hear that conversation so much. So the focus tilts towards we're being helped. We actually have nothing we need help. But if you look at that continent, all the minerals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, come from the continent. I'm not going to go into that because like, oh, it sounds like they're moaning and complaining again. We're not complaining. I'm not complaining. It's about saying this is the fact, and these guys are going to get wise to that. We are three generations down the line from when the country got independent. By the fourth, the fifth, and sixth generation, they will start asking a lot more questions. The why question will become louder and bigger. It'll be, a, it'll be a, a, a avalanche of questions around what is going on on the continent and what they can do and what their future is. And that's why we tell them all the time, you are your future. You must be part of the decision-making process. You must understand what is going on in order to make informed and intelligent decisions around what happens with your life. And what happens with their life happens with, to their country and happens to their continent because that's where they find their spaces. You know, people often tell me, oh, you know what? This is great. You are going to get a lot of money because you're keeping them at home and not letting them come to us guys in Europe because we've got a flood of refugees coming. And I always say, don't worry about that. The guys that come to you guys is maybe 3%. The majority are with us in Kenya, Kahama, Dadaab, uh, Dadaab yes, Dadaab, the, the, the refugee camps. We have in the million, half a million, I think, in Dadaab. In Dadaab. On the whole continent, there are millions of people who are displaced, who stay on the continent. And the interesting thing about people being displaced and moving on is that initially, people just leave their rural area and go to the urban area. That's the first step. That's the first move, because they don't see a future in the rural area. That's when they move away and go to the neighboring countries, before they even consider going to Europe. You know, Europe is way, not even on their radar for the majority, because they're just looking for a better life within a close vicinity of where they are. Because, as I always say, nobody leaves their country freely. Nobody willingly goes away from their home. You can imagine, you go on holiday, you go on holiday for two weeks, and after that, oh, I want my own bed, I want to go home, I want to eat my nice, I love German bread, by the way, I'm going to eat my nice German bread, you know? And it's true, nobody wants to stay away from home. So the people who leave, leave out of desperation, having no alternative, feeling pressed because they can't live in their own countries because they're not financially independent. Even myself, before I went back home, I was in Europe for a while with my 29 years, I won't say how many years. And it took me a while to go home because I was worried about my financial stability. Because we don't create a space in our own countries on the continent where our own people can come back. We talk of brain drain, but the brain drain is people who are highly intelligent, have studied abroad, have the same rights to earn the same kind of salaries as people here, and they go back home, like myself, you work at the university, and then your salary, next to your expatriate colleague is eight times less than what they earn in your own country. I would like that to happen here. I worked here as a student and I never got more than the Germans and many times I didn't get the job because they said my German wasn't good enough. So do you see what I mean? This kind of a situation has to stop because otherwise it makes it very, very difficult to interact and very, very difficult for us to develop and to grow our own communities. Because all these situations get in the way and blur our path towards development, towards being a, 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 a stable uh, community or communities with an infrastructure that makes it possible for people to stay at home or even stay in the rural area, in this case, where our work is. We target children who are between the ages of 4 to 25 years old. We work in the rural area, Western Kenya. You've seen the pictures. We also do a little bit of work in Germany. We have a workshop project called You Are Your Future because the idea is around the mentality of the young people to realize that they need to take their lives into their own hands and be the, the ones who drive where they get to in their lives. And also because we have to interact with each other. So I want young people outside of the continent also to know what's going on in the, on the continent and be able to relate to it. 
We work a lot with the personalities of the young people we, 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 we have in our organization. We have about 480 on our books. The ones who come very, very regularly, about 200. And one of the things we do, which is usually kind of looked at like what? We make them pay a small fee to be a member of our foundation. The fee is 50 Kenya shillings, which is just 50 cents a year. But for little people, it sounds like a lot of money. And it means they own it. So all the pictures you're seeing, all the things that we do there, we tell the children, you own it, it's yours. So you look after it. So, and the ownership becomes very, very real. They're very proud of where they are. You can see from their faces. And they actually take part and they, 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 they determine with us what happens in the foundation. We have a pillar called personality development and character building. This is around the mentality change. We try to change the mentality. In particular, kids in the rural areas always think they're worth nothing. Because we are taught in our culture to be very kind of like submissive, don't raise your voice. When adults are talking, you keep quiet. And we are going against that grain. We're telling kids, you need to look people in the eye. Because when we started, people, I'd be talking to a young person and they're looking at the wall or they're looking ahead or over my shoulder or whatever because they didn't feel they could look at me because they felt like they were going to be rude. So we'd have to have the conversation about, you need to look people in the eye. It's a bit dark here. I have an exercise I usually do around looking people in the eye. And if you go outside and look at each other in the eye, you'll see there's a certain light in your eyes. And if people don't see that light, I mean, what happens when somebody dies? What do we do? We close their eyes. So the light has gone out. And if we don't see that light, I'd I tell them, you might as well be dead to me because I can't relate to you. So it's a bit radical, and those who know Africa and know our culture find it radical. But what we do is we try to balance it and teach them how they can still look somebody in the eye without being disrespectful, so that they get the attention of that person, so the person realizes they exist and takes them seriously. Because even if you're a four-year-old, we say, you need to take responsibility for your life. Because if you drop that cup of water and it breaks and you go, <gasps> Then as a four-year-old, you know you did something wrong. And next time, you'll be careful. So by knowing wrong from right, you must take responsibility. And that's what we try to teach them. So we need to see that light in your eye. We need to hear your voice. Because when we hear your voice, we take you seriously. Once we've seen you, we've seen the light in your eyes, we then hear you, we take you seriously. And when we take you seriously, you have to then act on what you say because you're accountable. Responsibility, accountability. That is what it means to own your future. And that's what we try and teach these children and young people. And in the process of doing that, when they get confident enough, then when you ask and talk to them about the power of why and the power of no, they're able to use that. I luckily, I think I got that with my DNA. When I was eight years old, from, uh, that's my memory, I always asked why. I'm the only girl in a family of boys, so you can understand why, right? I always asked why. Many times I was told, oh, it's because you're a girl. Because, actually, it was always because I was a girl. But I continued to ask why. My dad would pull his hair out. He would tell me, don't ask why. Just do as you're told. And I'd ask why. You know? So, and it, it helped me because I was able to get a position for myself by the fact that I would ask why and I would get an answer. So that is very, very important as well. So we do a different exercise around uh, being able to use your voice, being able to ask why, being able to participate and being able to be part of the process that makes your life and takes you to a place of financial independence. We do a lot with education training. We make sure they stay in school. We give them tuition, so we have value add to the school system because we want them to redefine who they are. And actually not redefine, to define who they are through their excelling, through working hard. And working hard doesn't mean you have to get a white collar job. It doesn't mean you have to get a formal education. It can be informal, formal. So we do a lot of vocational. We do a lot of vocational training as well. And that's why you see that huge building there. It's going to be a sports center, a vocational center, and a recreation center. Because we want them to learn how to work with their hands. Because there are many roads that take you to Rome. If you want to one day become a doctor and you have no money, don't not be because nobody sponsored you and nobody gave you money. Because that's the trend. If you're not being helped by anybody, you don't become anything. Because it's not your responsibility. It's your uncle, your dad, your whoever. So we say, no, go become an electrician. And the money you make as an electrician, you can then later on go and go to school with that. And maybe you won't even go to school because nowadays electricians learn a, earn a lot. In Europe, to come out to go and look at your, your, your electrics that are spoiled is 60 pounds before he's even done anything. So we're trying to teach them that there are many ways. You have options. You have opportunities. And with these options and opportunities, you can make your life a better life. So the key messages we have 
around the work we do is that we also create a space where not only do they have the learning, not only do they get better characters, their personality, but we also look at the economic uh, uh, income generation. What can they do? They have land. You've seen the land. They have to work that land. So we do kitchen gardens with them, which start with small little gardens, but because they have a lot of land, they grow more. They take it to market, they make money. Then we do financial literacy work because poverty is no excuse. You can save money and you can save at the lowest common denominator and still every two weeks you put money away. And those are the schemes that we set up so that the families, so that the, 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 the children see their parents do that and they themselves also then do it. So when we work with the children who pay us the 50, shilling, 50 shillings per year, the parents also are part of the group. And the parents also pay 50 shillings a year, which actually for parents is peanuts. But we get them into the fold and they own it. So we work with them around financial literacy so they learn how to handle money because poverty is no excuse. We create spaces, you've seen that. Physical spaces, as in buildings, we're building a huge center where we're gonna do all the different things we had, I've just mentioned. We also create mental spaces. The mental spaces are girls and boys forums where we talk about the issues they have agenda issues and beyond. We do camping retreats where they also interact with other groups, other organizations, other children from elsewhere, the German school among others. We have parents and caregivers forums where we talk to the parents and caregivers about they need to participate and not sit around and wait for us to do everything for their children because we just enable, we don't give handouts, which at first was difficult. And then we also do a baraza, which is a community meeting where the community is going to talk about what issues they have and how they're going to solve those issues. Of course, they usually expect me to do it. And I'm like, well, I heard the list, let's prioritize now, what are you guys gonna do? And initially they're like, oh, okay. And, but slowly you start to weed out who are the leaders within the community who will take the steps towards making a change happen. The whole working is being done around getting the mentality to a place where they themselves take responsibility for what happens in their lives. So again, the key, Messages for us in the work that we do is not aid, but trade. So moving towards a space where they're economically in a place where they become part of the value change and they grow. So it's economic growth, more growth than development because we take them from somewhere where they already are. When you want to develop something, there was nothing there and you start. And we say they have already got something. All we have to do is take it to the next level because we have the exposure, we have the know-how, we have the contacts. So we enable, we create a space where they can then do that, but they do it. And that's, you see here, if you see the little gardens, those gardens you are looking at, those are the gardens of the parents in the homes and the children work with them because the children bring their parents to the group. So impact and outcome of the work that I do, like I said, mindset change, don't be a victim, taking responsibility, being proactive, being accountable. So you determine what happens in your life because you're accountable for it. You are responsible for your life. Creating situations where the young people can be employable. We don't talk about employing, we talk about employability. And I think everywhere has that problem. I think Europe has that problem as well. You have to make the young people employable, which means they have to be critical, creative thinkers. Not just yes ma'am, no ma'am, or I've learned it by heart people. Because that's what we get at the moment locally in Kenya. And income generation, most important, because if you're financially independent, you won't end up in the slums. You won't end up waiting for somebody to find your family in a lotto kind of situation and move you to the next Next level. So to conclude, what we do is called sustainable socio-economic growth and development. Some people tell me what I'm doing is community development, but I shy away again from the word development. And our model really wants to ensure, really, really wants to ensure because it's a fact that poverty is not used as an excuse. It cannot be used as an excuse. And in our interaction with, with all of you folk, the West, what I say, and this is a, an, an analogy I'll finish with, is when all this started, our interaction with each other, the relationship with the West, forget colonialism, that's over and there's no excuse, we can't even discuss that because that was just a period of getting to know each other if you want. Um, the first thing was we're gonna help this continent. So it was, you gave us fish. I have a fish analogy. So what I always say is, and then, no, oh, no, then you said, no, wait, wait, fish, don't give them fish because they're passive. Let's teach them how to fish, okay? I take it a step further because that's the cooperation part of things. I would say, don't give us fish. Don't teach us how to fish. Ask us if we eat fish. That's when the conversation starts. And you might learn something from us if you do that. Thank you very much. Asante.
ist gut. Thank you so much, Dr. Alma Obama. Thank you very much. Thank you. Asante Sana. I spoke too long. Asante. No, no, you, you are perfect. Actually, okay. we have a few minutes for questions. Okay. If you're okay with that. I'm good. Would you like to join me over here just for a few, few minutes? Lovely. So, I hope we just have a few minutes, but if you would like what to, I get to say? Say, you uh, can sit over there, Dr. Okay. Obama. Thank you. I hope you entered your questions into Slido. Yes, a few people did. So, the audience has basically typed up all these questions while you were speaking, and then they voted very democratically oh. on this. Saudi <laughs> coup. Very powerful voices here in the audience. <laughs> she speaks Swahili, by the way. <laughs> so, um, Anonymous is asking, what do you think about institutions like the Grameen Bank, where women can get microcredits? Are they helpful? Ah, oh, I do like Eunice a lot, so um, I have met him. I know the work he does. That's the founder? Yeah. They clap for us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I think the only thing that I would say is that in my work, the work that we do, because we, like I said, we have a savings scheme, is that we don't do work that creates debt at all. We don't loan money to uh, our beneficiaries because people, when people think they're poor, they, they, they have a behavior that is a, a behavior of somebody who's poor. They actually spend money very easily and they don't know how to generate money so well. So they need a lot of technical support. So if you're meaning that you have to walk the walk with them. So if you're going to do a situation where you have a scheme where you're lending money, it's very important that there's a very good business plan for what that money is going to be used for. So it's a lot of work. And in some cases, the model has been taken and that extra work has not been done with it. And that is the fear because there are some communities where they get in such bad debt. And I'm thinking, and this has got nothing to do with Eunice and the Grameen Bank, is that where you have such bad debt, you end up doing things. I, I, I know that I've read about situations where Indian girls are being married off because the father has so much debt, and or they, they kill themselves. So for me, it's, it's a difficult space to be in. So the way we work, we, we work very, very simple. We really, the people, our savings scheme is where the people take their own money, the parents use their own money, and we have a system that's called, it's a lowest common denominator. So if we were a group and you had 10, 100 shillings that you could, you could put into the, every two weeks into the, the kitty, the bank, and I have 50 shillings, then we go by mine, the lowest common denominator, and every two weeks. And then we borrow from that money and you give it back with interest. But it's your own money. So the bank requires you to continuously borrow, but it's your own money. So they have small amounts and they don't get into debt with a bigger institution that then takes it all away from them and they lose their existence. So for me, in that context, we don't get involved in a, in a, in a, in a borrowing situation, a loaning situation. I think it's a little bit dangerous because you need to get that mentality of poverty out of the people's heads and they have to stop thinking of themselves as, as poor. So you need to create a situation where they're starting to make money and seeing themselves, oh, actually, I, I have something here. I, I'm actually not that poor. Yeah. Mm. There you go. Yeah. It's your clap. <laughs> here's, something, <It's> sharing. <laughs> here's something that I've actually also been wondering since the audience here is, is quite large. I've had the, the pleasure of living in Africa and working there, but a lot of us haven't. And the, Stephanie is also asking, the desire to help is a hard feeling to let go. How can we, as a regular person in Europe, help Africa in a sustainable way? Should we stop wanting to help? Should we start listening? Listening, as you said. Okay, the first thing you have to do is get rid of that word help. Yeah. Because why are you helping? How old are you, Stephanie? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so much that can be done here when you're talking help. Because help is charity, help is philanthropy. That's the first thing. So don't think you have, you don't owe Africa anything except honesty and real trade. Beyond that, you don't know, you, because to be honest, many things are being done in Africa that shouldn't be done. The, the continent is being ripped off from another end, and I, this is me just being a bit rough with my words, just because for lack of time to think of better words. And then on the other end, you feel you have to help. No, go back and look at the kind of trade relationships that Africa has, the trade agreements. That's where, if you really want to help, that's where you can help, by pushing your governments to start working with us in a fair way. So the idea of feeling you have to help the continent is, is, is difficult. Remove the word help. You know, and then the other thing, and it's come up really appropriately, yeah. is common sense. Because whatever interaction you have with us, does it make sense? I have some young interns who come to us, and they're 19, 20 something, and they work with us in our program, and then they're going out to the local shopping center for drinks, and the poor 19 year old feels he has to pay for all the drinks because he comes from Germany or, or England or whatever, and they're so much wealthier. But this young man has no money because he's actually saved all his pennies working jobs to be able to come and work with us. And then I ask him, well, why? Why are you paying for everything? Tell them to pay. And if you don't have the money, don't pay. You guys sit together and drink water. 
It doesn't make sense. So your relationship has to make sense. And you mustn't be lazy. I speak your German for those who are German, your language perfectly. It was hard work. I worked on it. So you need to work on relationships. That's how I see it. See eye to eye, no yeah. longer yeah. wanting to help yeah. and wanting to listen. Yeah. I mean, there are thousands of people like me on the continent, thousands. Yes. I won't allow you to talk to me over there and you're over here. And it's the same with them. And it's, there's no need to do that because you can learn so much from me as I can learn so much from you. It's a give and take. And sometimes you'll win more than I will. But at least I know that I had the conversation and I fought hard. So even with trade doesn't mean you have to be fair. I never talk about fair trade. I talk about real trade. You don't have to be fair. But as long as I know that I'm being shafted, because that's how business works. For those people who are doing business, business is tough. Whoever gets the better deal wins it. But that's what business is. And that's the relationship we want, actually. That's the relationship I want my young people to have with you guys. I've actually never worked with uh, more people who are multilingual than I have when I uh, worked in yeah. Africa. It's incredible. My one colleague spoke uh, Kinawanda, Swahili, English, French. Absolutely incredible. She's a good example for that as well. Multilingual, very, very good at we every single language. We have no choice. Language. It's incredible, though, <laughs> I have to say. So a lot to learn. So last question for today, and thank you for staying. Mm -hmm. Paolo is asking, how do you think we can change the perception of the people in Western countries that aid is not the solution but part of the problem of poverty? He's quoting Dambisa Moyo here, yeah, yeah. who is quite a, yeah. a distinguished scholar. Yeah. So how do you think we can change it? I think you have to be more open to the idea that maybe you guys don't have all the answers. I think that's... Yep. <laughs> and then talk to us. Don't give us fish. Don't teach us how to fish. Ask us if we eat fish. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Please give another round of applause to Dr. Thank Alma you. Obama. Asante sana. Asante. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Obama. Please stick around. In a few minutes, we will hear on the stage from the first recognized cyborg in the world, Neil Harbison. Super interesting. The guy literally implanted an antenna into his brain. Please stay. Cannot make it more interesting than that. Thank you.